name is, uh, e, e, what is it, e, e, Isaias, which is, which is God is our salvation. Yeah. So, saved once again. I'm glad that you're here. Why don't you do me a favor this morning and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is where we are, and uh, you just got to try to remind yourself here why we're studying the book of Acts, and um, man, it's just, I'm just glad I could be honest with you guys. Like I, I had it all planned out just now, and I totally just, my mind is blank. Wow. 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 Like blank. Wow. Wow. Uh, that's kind of crazy. I had it all planned out, really. The whole intro, everything, the whole thing. I had it all planned out. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's, he's been wrecking my life for the last 15 years, just in a good way. But yeah, just crazy. But we're studying the book of Acts because, um, you know, our church is, is, so we have this little catchphrase in our church, right? And it's, it's that we're a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world, right? That's what we're supposed to be. That's the revolution, right? And so what happens is we're supposed to come together as a family of faith, and that's why you come to church every week and maybe even several times during the week, and you read your Bibles on your own personal time as well because you need to be reminded of what it is you're supposed to do. What is, it, this, what is this culture creating thing? What does it mean? It means that there's a different way that we're supposed to be living and we come to church to be reminded of those things. And that's why within, the, within the, the covers of this book, we find out who we are, who God is, and how we're supposed to live. And we're supposed to bring that thing out to the world, right? We're not supposed to let the world creep in here too much. We're supposed to be creeping out there. And so that's why we come to church, and that's why I hope you're here this morning as well. I hope you're not here just to, just to sing a good song. Those are good songs. But, but I hope that you're here so that you can be reminded. We're all, we're, we're all parents right here. Most of us are parents, and we understand that you need to just tell your kids over and over and over again to, and just drill it home and drill it home till finally, hopefully, they get it through their head, right? You get that, right? Well, we're God's children, and you're stubborn and, and, and pig-headed just like me, and we don't like to listen, and we quickly forget. And so that's why God has it set up to daily read the Scriptures, to, to daily gather together as a family of faith, to be reminded of these truths so we know how to live our life. And so the reason why we're studying the book of Acts, of course, is because we're supposed to be bringing something different out to the world, and we're here to figure out what that is. Are you here to figure out what that is today? That's why I'm here, right? I've been studying all week long to figure out what it is I'm supposed to be doing, and then I'm trying to be faithful with that to pass on to you that which I have learned. And so the reason why we're studying the book of Acts, let's just take you back to the beginning of the book of Acts, right? In the first chapter, the, the eighth verse of the whole book, Jesus Christ speaks. So we should be listening, right? He says, listen, when the Holy Spirit falls on you, like when, you, when, when I give you my Holy Spirit, right, Ephesians 1.13, he gives you his Holy Spirit when you believe. So if you've bent the knee to Jesus Christ, then he has given you his Holy Spirit. So that verse is for you if you're a Christ follower, right? He says, when the Holy Spirit falls upon you, you will receive power, right? You'll receive power. That means that there's something you're going to get that you didn't have before, right? You didn't have this power before. You used to be this person, but now you have this power. And listen, this power, it says in Scripture, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. It's that power, right? So you think, I'm going to be able to do something pretty awesome with that, right? That's not just a firecracker. That's a stick of dynamite, man. And it should do something, right? So, so when you, listen, when the Holy Spirit falls upon you, you will receive power. And when you receive power, you know, many of you may speak in tongues. Many of you may prophesy. Many of you might cast out demons. You may rise, raise someone from the dead, man. I don't know each person gets their own gift from the Holy Spirit. I don't know exactly in detail what that power is going to look like manifesting in your life. But there's something that goes across the board. Every single believer gets this. You'll receive power and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Right? Like, listen, 
you will. That means it's definite and it's a command. No matter how you look at that sentence, it's one of the two. It's either it happened or it will happen, right? I like to look at it as both. He's given me this power and I'm going to obey him, right? He says, so listen, it's not optional. And if you're not his witness, that means that people don't see you and see Jesus in you when you're walking and talking and going wherever you go in the normal rhythms of your life. If you're not, if you're not displaying Christ, I would check whether the power is in you. Because that kind of power that's inside someone that raised Christ from the dead, if that's in you, it should show. That ain't no little thing, right? So listen, so you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. And that, So that's why Jesus, saying the same exact message with different words, says in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, all authority in heaven and earth. Let me ask you guys a question. You look like a smart bunch. How much is left in the universe after you cover heaven and earth? Nothing, right? So all authority in heaven and earth is mine, Jesus said. So go make disciples of all people, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them like you don't stop there. Hey, I got this guy saved. I led my neighbor to the Lord. Awesome. Are you teaching him? Is he growing in faith? Are you meeting with him for coffee and a Bible once a week? What are you doing with him? You, you make disciples, you baptize them, and then you teach them to obey all that Jesus has taught you. So if you've learned anything from the Lord, it is your responsibility as a Christ follower to be his witness, to be his disciple maker. You're not allowed to sit on your fanny and do nothing and wait for glory. That is not your option, okay? It's not your option. So the reason why Jesus is so bold, like, you will be my, my, my witness. Now go, all authorities might listen, because there's going to be things that are going to stand in the way of this. This is hard work. And that's why last week we talked about engaging and trying, right? Speak boldly. It's not easy. There's going to be things and people, including yourself, your laziness, your self-centeredness, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your government, your whatever. They're all going to be telling you, you don't do this, right? Don't, don't tell me about your Jesus. Keep it to yourself. I don't want to hear it. Save it for the church, preacher, right? And, and I'm telling you, don't do this. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I don't care what they told you because I'm in charge. All authority. How much authority is left when the all has been used up? Show me. None, right? No authority is left in all of the universe. Jesus said, go make disciples of all people, right? And that's why it says that if anyone's in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, right? Because you used to be this, but now his power is inside of you. And so I don't know what you used to do, but that doesn't matter anymore, right? doesn't make any difference what you did before right? Now you've been repurposed. Now you're different, right? Now you're different. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Take it literally, man. Don't just make it like some Christian rhetoric. It sounds nice, bumper sticker, t-shirt, right? No. The old has died, right? That means that that person's gone, forgotten. We don't think about that person anymore. We don't talk about that person anymore. Nothing. We don't live that way anymore, right? If they're in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold. That means they should see something, remember? Remember when you have that power inside of you? It's not a little firecracker. It's a fire. It's a, it's a stick of dynamite, right? That's why the scripture writers could tell, you know, they could say, behold the new man. Because when you have that kind of power inside of you that raised Christ from the dead, people should be able to see it, right? There should be something different about you. Right? So then he takes all these people, he gives them the Holy Spirit, they have the power to be my witness, to make disciples of all people, and I'm commanding you to do it, and then he fits all those people together into a church. Okay? That's what he does, Ephesians 4.16. God fits the body together perfectly. He takes all these people that he's infused with the Holy Spirit, they've been repurposed for his use, and he puts them together, and as each person does their own special work, we're all called to be his witness, we're all called to be and make disciples, and I don't know what exactly what you're going to do in that process and on that team, but you're supposed to do something. And when you're all together, you do that work that you've been called to do specifically, and when we actually all do it, it helps the others to grow. I hope that when you come here and you listen to me hollering at you for an hour, it's helping you grow. I hope that it is. Okay? But I'd like to have a little growth myself. 
Maybe you could do a little bit of reciprocating here. Maybe you could do something. Maybe you could do something, right? We could all do something to build the body of Christ. You've all been called to be disciple makers. Who are you making a disciple of? Are you encouraging? I, I shared with on Facebook yesterday. I should know better than to share on Facebook about coming to church because fewer people come when I do that. I mean, it says in Hebrews 10.24, don't neglect gathering together, but to encourage one another, especially now since the time of his arrival is closer. I don't know when it is. I think it was Jonathan who said it to me on the phone. I don't know when he's coming, but I know today is a day closer than yesterday. Right? I don't know when it is either. It could be a thousand years from now, but it might be before the end of my sentence. And so the, more, the closer we get to the day of the Lord, right, the more we should be getting together to encourage one another. The more we should motivate each other to love and good works. Why? So the advancement of the kingdom happens. Right? But instead, we're doing less and less and less and less. Look, less and less and less and less all the time. It's discouraging. It's very discouraging. Right? Can I just be honest with you guys? Can we not be that church? Like, I'm tired of that. Like, let's not be that church that does it less and less. Let's be the church that does it more and more. Start making God a priority in our life, right? So he puts us together. He saves us. He infuses us, up, infuses us with the Holy Spirit. And then he puts us together into a body of believers so we could do some work to advance his kingdom. See, God, God saved you for a greater purpose than to just send you to heaven, okay? He saved you, and then he placed you here at Revolution Church to live a certain way. And, and as we live a certain way, right, it helps to sway other people to live that way. That, that's the reason why you've been saved. But my fear, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room who fears this, my fear is that we put so much focus on, hey, if you were, gonna, if you were to die today, where would you go? Right? That's what most evangelists will do, right? If you're going to die today, where would you go? That's the ultimate question, right? And you scare them, you scare the hell out of people, right? That's what you're supposed to do when you evangelize. And what it does is it makes heaven the big thing. Heaven is a big thing, right? Do you agree? It's a big thing. It's an awesome thing, right? You don't deserve it. It's incredible. I don't even know how good it's going to be, but it's going to be better than that. And, and I'm excited about getting to go there and hanging out with you guys and actually seeing the Lamb face to face and bowing down and worship Him and all that streets of gold stuff, right? I'm in on that. But when you make heaven the ultimate thing of salvation... Right? I fear that when the people that make it all about heaven, man, I got saved, I'm going to heaven, awesome. I think a lot of those people aren't going to ever see heaven. I don't think they're going to see heaven. I think a lot of people are going to be missing out because they think that's it. That the fullness of your salvation is that someday you get to go to heaven. That's awesome. Hooray for you, right? But that's not the reason why you got saved. You got saved for purpose. That's why you got saved. You didn't get saved so you, to, you can go to heaven. You got saved. I got saved so you could go to heaven. I got saved so you could go to heaven. I got saved so you could go to heaven. And I had to do my part to, to, to try to sway other people so they can go to heaven. It's not about you, man. It's not about you. And the end goal of salvation is not so that you can go to heaven, right? It's, listen, you were saved to build his church. Period. That's the reason why you got saved. So when you go back to the book of Acts, chapter 1, right, and you see there in, in 1 8, it talks about the Holy Spirit falling and you'll receive power. Oh, it's raining finally. There's the hurricane. Woo! You go back to Acts 1 8, it says you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses, right? So the assumption here is this you used to be this, you used to say that. You used to think this. You used to, used to go here and do these things. That's who you were. But when my Holy Spirit falls on you, boom! You're repurposed, right? You're no longer that person anymore. And, and now, instead of what you used to be and what you used to do, now you have a new job description. Now you're a witness for Jesus Christ. That's the... Listen, this might be why another reason why this church isn't so full. Because nobody wants to hear this. That is the singular purpose for your existence. Amen. Building his church is the singular purpose of your existence. It's the reason why you're breathing now. Right? There's, there's no other reason. Think about it for a second. Let's, we're logical, smart people, right? If you get to get saved and go to heaven, why would God keep you down here where it's hell half the time? Right? So, so why, why is it? 
so that you can help others escape this joint. That's the reason why you've been saved. And so we've been repurposed. And so we study the book of Acts for two reasons. We've been saying this for months now. We study it for truth shared and for um, examples shown. Right? I want to know, like, truth shared. Like, what, what, it, what do we believe? What, what are we supposed to do? Who, who is this God? Who am I? What's my job? Right? And then examples shown. Okay, what does it look like? And that's the reason why we're studying the book of Acts, right? Jesus said some things. Jesus did some things. He commissioned people. He said, do this. This is who I am. This is who you are. This is what I want. And we study the book of Acts because those dudes got it right, right? They responded properly to, to Jesus. And so we want to watch them. The, the, the book of Acts is the how and what of Christian response to Christ and his salvation. That's what the book of Acts is, okay? So let's, let's do this. Let's read Acts chapter 19. And that's how long I've been preaching for. Ten minutes? Ten minutes to get to the, to the verse. Listen. This is important. What's more important than God's word in your life? What's more important? I'd like to keep you here for four or five hours and do this. I mean, not, no joke, right? Like, what else? What, I mean, let's just, honesty in church, right? You guys want to be honest in church? Is there anything more important in your life than this? And don't give me a church answer. Like, think about it for a second. If this is the word of God, and it revives the soul and refreshes the heart, what more, what's, what's more important? What could you do when you leave here that could be better than that? What could refresh your heart and, and revive your soul more than this? That's why I preach long. Because it's important, man. It's important. So we're going to read a fairly long section of Scripture because it's important and it's good for you and I love you. So I'm going to read this with you. Acts 19, verses 23 through 41. Are you there? You got God's Word in front of you? Yep. Everyone? Good? All right. So about that time, doesn't matter what time that is, I just know that in the previous paragraph, the Spirit of God is telling Paul where to go and what to do. That's awesome, right? And so, this is crazy. The Spirit of God, look, what's the, what's the title of the chapter? It's not divine, but it kind of summarizes what's going to happen here. What's the title? Ephesus. Right, there's a riot in Ephesus, right? And listen, that's where the Holy Spirit's leading him. So for all of us that are being taught the comfort gospel, right, the Holy Spirit is telling Paul to go to places where there will be persecuting riots for his faith. That's where he's being sent. Okay? About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. You see, that's what Christianity is. It's not just, hey, I get to go to heaven, right? No, it's, it's a way. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of speaking. It's a way of living, right? That's what salvation is. That's what Christianity is. It began with Demetrius, this, this, this riot, this problem, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy, he called them together along with other empl others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Here's his speech. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. I mean, that right there, that just shows you how stupid people are. I mean, right there, right? Well, of course not. You made it, dude. How can it have any power over you if you're the one who made it? Duh. No, people really are sheeple. <clears throat> All right. But as you, okay, this is where our wealth comes from. You got no power. Paul has persuaded many people to handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, 
but throughout the entire province. I mean, you might want to look up in the back of your Bible. I should have done this. I should have put a map up on the wall where you could see this. But just imagine this whole area around, like above, uh, uh, just north of the Mediterranean Sea, the whole area up there, all those cities and everything. Paul, this influence that they had, Paul and his other buddies, these other disciples, they're, they're gathered. Remember last week we talked about they gathered like 810 times or something in, in, in two years. They just gathered every single day for public discussions and worship and study of the scriptures. They met every day so that every single person in the entire province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's awesome. And, and so because of this, this amazing hard work that these disciples put in, like, they're losing business, man. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of, of public respect for our business, they, he said. I'm also concerned that the temple of our great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess, worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world will be robbed of her great prestige. A real god doesn't get robbed of that. At this, at this, their anger boiled, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, that's a cool name, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak. But when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again, and kept it up for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. At last the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government since there is no cause for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them and they dispersed. So, I think there's a big message right here in this. I mean, there's lots, there's lots of stuff there. But if there's anything in this text that we can learn, it is this, that the church and the gospel that it has should greatly impact the greater culture, not the other way around. Okay? And I think that what we're witnessing in our country, at least, or at least in this context, is that that's not the case at all right now. At all. And I don't think that's God's fault in any way. I'm just going to say it's my fault, it's your fault, it's our fault. Okay? Let me just tell you why. Okay. So if you study the church in, in America, right now in America, we have about 400,000 churches. 400,000 churches, okay? Some of them are Catholic, some of them are Protestant, right? And in the Protestant thing, we've got Luther and Episcopal and Baptist and Pentecostal, all those different groups. But at the end of the day, the entire community of of Christ followers, the people who have bent the knee to Jesus in whatever way, and we can fight about that, which way is right and wrong, and that's your problem, this is a non-denominational church, we're just a Bible-believing church, okay, but whatever it is, there's about 400,000 churches in America right now, a lot of churches, right, a lot of churches, there are 328 million people 
in our country. Now, 70% of these people claim that they are Christ followers. Okay? They claim that they are Christ followers. That would mean it's about 240 million people in our country that claim to be Christ followers. Now, the average church in America is 75 people. If you multiply 400,000 times 75, you get a number. It's 30 million. Okay? What that means is that there are 200 and million Christian Americans that are not participating in Christ's design and plan to reach the world. 210 million of us are sitting at home right now, not involved in, in, in advancing the mission that they've been called into. Okay? 3% of churchgoers tithe. 3%. Okay? 3 So of, 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 of the 30 million people that go to church in America, 3% of them are financially supporting the endeavor. That's pathetic. That's pathetic, okay? Let me give you some more information. During this quote-unquote pandemic, which is a joke, okay? A joke. So I'm just going to tell you right now, we have over 99.7% survival rate, okay? It's not a pandemic, okay? There, there are, there are, the total amount of deaths in every single person that has died is a loved one and someone cares about them and they're precious, made in God's image, and they have value, Okay, but the total amount of people that have died in this country, in this entire country, there is more than double that number that live in our little county. It's no reason to close a church ever, right? It's the only place that has hope, right? So you don't close it, right? You fill it. You fill it, okay? So now listen, during this little so-called joke of a pandemic, when they're closing churches and, and pastors like, oh, we're going we're gonna to reach more people because we're going to use the Internet and we're going to reach people that don't go to church, right? That's awesome, except Barna Group that's, that surveys the life of the church in our world says that 48% of normal churchgoers, which no one's going to begin with, right? The normal churchgoer, 48% of them during the months of May and June never watched one sermon. Well, we'll watch on TV. We'll, we'll curl up on the couch and we'll watch a sermon, right? The Bible says it's supposed to encourage one another, right? To motivate one another to love and good deeds. How are you going to motivate me when you're watching me on your phone on your couch? Are you motivating me? No, you're not motivating me at all, right? There's only one person motivating there, the preacher. But the entire church, they're sitting at home doing nothing. They're not doing their part. Right? 48% of them didn't watch one sermon for two months. Here's another sad situation. Here's the church in America, man. And I just want to say, let's not be this church. Okay? Listen. 70% of Americans say they're Christians. At the end of 2019, Barna said that 14% of Americans read their Bible every day. 14% of the church is reading their Bible once a day. 14 can you say pathetic? Yeah. yeah. Since the pandemic, it's down to 8%. 8%. Do you ever wonder why the church is so pathetically weak in our country? Do you ever, do you ever wonder why there's 400,000 churches and the majority of the people in this country claim to be Christ followers, yet where's the, where's the aura Where's the, st where's the smell of life coming off of this nation that's supposed to be Christian? You, do, you even, do you even know? D does, it even s does it even smell a little bit like Christianity here? Where, let me ask you guys a question. 70% is a very big majority, right? It's a big, very big majority. So let me ask you a question. I don't want to be all political here today, but let me ask you a question. If 70% of our country says they're Christ followers, why is it that the, that, the, that the school system that we pay for is teaching evolution? Why? Why is that the case? If 70% of our people believe in creation, why is our school system making it illegal to pray? 
Just tell me why. Because we're weak and pathetic. That's why. Because no one has a freaking spine to stand up and say what's right. That's the problem. It's not that we don't believe it. It's just we don't care enough about it to say anything about it. That's the problem. That's the problem. Okay? No one's giving. No one's serving. No one's attending. Right? But listen, when, you, when, 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 when Jesus Christ's followers actually commit themselves to something, and they actually gather, they commit to gathering, and commit to praying, and commit to giving, and commit to serving, and they, and they, they gather together, his disciples, right? You guys. When they make a decision to, to actually engage with, with the church, and engage with Jesus Christ, and engage with the lost world, and try really hard, and speak boldly every single day, right? That can disrupt common culture and make sin die. That's what the church is for, right? That's what the church is for. That's why this thing exists. It's not to get more people into the seats and have a fuller room. Like, that's awesome if we could pull that thing off, but it's so that those people can influence the people that are not here. And when you influence the people that are not here, guess what happens to your church? They start coming here so they can have what you have and go out and get some more people. And bring them into the kingdom. The, the king's glory is a growing population, right? Not a declining one. 6,000 churches in America close their doors every single year. And that doesn't mean they move to a different building. They put a padlock on it, said for sale, and quit and left. And all the people are gone. That's what happens to a church. And I'm telling you right now, just honestly in church, we're like that. We're right here. We have no money left again. Unless this something changes, we're going to be on that list. I'm just being honest. I love you enough to tell you. We are right there. So for those that won't make a commitment to the, to the mission that they've been called into, this is a wake-up call to you. Not to the ones that are necessarily here right now. But if you're not here every single week, it's a call to you. And if you're sitting there watching at home lazy, it's a call to you. If you've been called to this church, you need to be here participating in what this church has been called to do. Okay, All of us. So listen, when we, when we are bold in our witness, when we engage in the work of the ministry, things happen. Sinful practices die. We saw that last week, right? The people that were being led to the Lord said many of them believed, and, and these people that were practicing sorcery and witchcraft, right, incantation books, they start confessing their sin publicly, and they came and they burned their incantation books. They burned them, right? We were at a... We were at a coffee house the other day. I won't tell you where it is or the name of it, right? But it's run by a church. And we went there to have coffee, and the line was out the door with all with, with their, the sheeple with their masks on. Oh, it was run by a church. They were celebrating Harry Potter's birthday. So they had special drinks that you could get at Hogsworth or whatever it's called. And people coming into a church-owned coffee shop with their, 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 their black things and the hats and little Harry Potter people. I mean, what the heck's going on here, man? You know what I mean? Like, that's pathetic. We didn't go. No, we didn't go. We went to another one, and then we went inside, and, and we sat there with no masks and hung out with our buddies and actually lived. Okay? Quit existing and start living. Sinful practices die when the church engages with the, com with the community in a powerful way. Sinful businesses die. Look at these guys. They're all freaking out in the, in the text we're reading. What are we going to do? This is our business. People aren't buying our little, our little statues anymore. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Listen, people don't, when, when, you, when, when, when Christ really buries down deep into your heart, you don't want to buy a little statue. You don't want to go to, 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 to Harry Potter Day at the, at the coffee house, right? You want to live for Jesus Christ. So sinful businesses, right? Strip joints close. Bars will close, right? Those things will close and churches will flourish. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want, right? So, so sinful practices die, sinful businesses die, and then sinful false religions will die in the presence of a powerful church. Right? Look what they're saying. The temple of Artemis and Artemis herself will lose her influence and prestige. They're freaking out. Because this is what can happen when a church actually engages with its world and takes this thing seriously. Where the church has a powerful presence, sin is unpopular. It's unpopular, Right? It's unpopular. But here's the problem. For too long, the church in America, which is the only one I'm part of, right? I'm not part of a church anywhere else. I'm part of the whole thing. But this is where we are. 
This is where you are, right? This is where God placed you. And, and, and too many of us for too long have been sitting on our fanny accepting way too little. Way too little. And we sit there and we just ingest a little bit of cultural poison, one little drink at a time. Well, I mean, it's, we don't have to go to church all the time. I mean, I know they did it every day, but we don't have to do that. I don't literally have to tithe, do I? I mean, other people do, and I, I kind of gave a little bit, and I don't, I don't have to serve there. I mean, there's other people that will do that. I just, you know, I just love to take it for granted, church. I like to show up, and everything's done for me. That's America for you, right? That's the way it is. And we sit around, and we drink the cultural poison one little shot at a time, accepting that there's no creation in school, accepting that we can't pray in school, just accepting it. Well, you know, just be tolerant. 70% of us say it's wrong, and we just sit back and relax and let our, 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 our Christianity just fade into nothing, drinking the poison of common culture one little shot at a time until we're so feeble and we're so numb that we'll accept anything. And so when the government says, close your church, okay, okay, I know your word says don't forsake the assembly, but I'm not going. Who are you? Huh. Who, who, who are you, right? Listen, I, I just want to encourage you, if you guys know who John MacArthur is, right? Awesome preacher. One of the most brilliant, awesome men of God this country and this world's ever known. And he's got a church in, in, in California. And in California, they're actually, because there's been a spike in this, this corona, they, they're actually closing the state again. And they made a mandate that you're not allowed to have church services inside. You can't. Like, done. So he preached a message last week called, Jesus is the head of the church, not Caesar. And he opened his church again, and there were 3,000 people in there, no masks, hugging and, and shaking hands and singing to the Lord, right, and praying and giving and all of that stuff, right? Because that's what we're supposed to do. Because, listen, because he said so. That's why, right? Remember what he said? Who has all authority in heaven and earth? The president? The government? The Congress, right? The police department? Who has all the authority in heaven and earth? Jesus Christ does. And his word said, don't forsake the gathering. So he, he starts gathering and wrote, together, wrote a letter, him and his elders, saying, this is why we're not listening to you, government. And you can go on to his website if you want. I'm just going to plug it. It's called Grace Community Church in California. And you can go there, read it, and then sign your name to it, standing with them. And I did. I did. I hope that you would do the same thing. Okay, but because our, our church is not supposed to be pathetic and weak, right? It's supposed to influence this in, entire community. There should be a there should be a massive difference because Revolution Church was here. It, the other day, I can't remember who I was talking to. Um, oh, it was Rich. He was sitting there talking to his buddy on the phone about coming in and jamming and playing some music the other night. And the guy said, he, I, "I I was only on one side of the conversation, right? I didn't hear exactly what the guy said, but I knew what was going on." He he was telling his friend where the church is. And he says to his friend, yeah, it's right down the street from you. He goes, where? He goes, yeah, in the Home Depot Plaza. The guy goes, oh, I didn't even know it was there. Why? That should never be the case, right? That's not, that's, that's not what the church is intended to be, okay? That's not what Christ's intention was for his church. Listen what the church, listen what, what the word of God calls the church, right? We're the salt of the earth, Right? That's who we are, right? We're, we're salt. Listen, salt influences things, right? Salt isn't passive. Salt affects every single thing that it touches. You ever have a canker sore? Drink some salt water. See what that does to you, right? It hurts, right? But it cleanses. It cures. It fixes it, right? But everything that it touches, salt influences that thing, right? It, it cleanses things. It preserves things. If we have something that's good, the, the, the church is supposed to preserve that thing, 
right? We're the pillar and foundation of truth. And, and salt flavors things. How many salt addicts are in the house, right? You put a bunch of salt and stuff. Why? Because it tastes good. We're, we're the church of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to bring flavor to the world, make it a better place, right? We're a culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing because we're the salt of the earth. We're supposed to bring beauty and flavor and seasoning and cleansing, right, and purifying. That's what the church does. If the, church, if the country's going downhill, it's because the agent of purification and cleansing and flavor is dead, that's the problem. And you're not going to get it from being a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't matter if, you, if we get Joe Biden or Donald Trump. They're not going to bring the beautiful flavor of the Savior to the world. Right? It doesn't make any difference who you get in office. We are the organization. We are the organism that's supposed to bring life to the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're also the light of the world. Right? We're, the, we're the people that are supposed to shine goodness into dark areas, right? And the world is dark. We see it. When you put it on the news, it's like, oh my gosh, like, is this even America anymore? Is this like Nicaragua or something? What's going on here? They're, they're burning down buildings. And it's crazy. It's dark. It's, it's dangerous. It's scary. It's crazy. Good is bad. Bad is good. I don't know what's going on anymore. I just want to run and hide in a cave. All of us are like that. Like, what's going on, right? But the church is the light of the world. We're the, we're the people that are supposed to offer hope and offer love and offer help to a lost and dark world. That's what the church is. And we're not doing it. We're not doing it because we got no power. We can't, we can't offer help when we got no people and no resources to help them. You see? But the ones that are called into the church are the ones that are supposed to provide for that so that we can be that light to the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And then we're the city on a hill. Picture it. Do you see it? We're the city on a hill, right? We're the place in a dark and hurting world where everyone's afraid that they can look and see a place where they can go and find hope and find a loving community that would accept them and love them and help them and shelter them. That's the city on a hill. So we're supposed to be visible. We can see it. Look, I'm hurting. Where do I go? Right there. That's where we go, right? The city on a hill. The church is a beautiful, cleansing, flavoring, hope-infusing, help-offering, loving community that's highly visible and always available that transforms the world. That's who you are. That's who you are, okay? It's different. We're not supposed to be depending on the government. The church is supposed to be the one that does this. We're the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the city on a hill. And as we see in our text that we read in Acts chapter 19, Christ's church was never intended to simply be little groups of people that gather here and there, sing a few songs, say some prayers, listen to a good sermon. No, so much more than that. You know, gathering to sing and pray and give and study and break bread and all that stuff. Yes to all of those things, right? But why do we do this? We do all this inward stuff because it's supposed to push us outward to impact our world. See, most churches are always promoting this. We're, we're outward focused. We're outward focused. And when you're outward focused, you got people that are spiritually dead trying to do the work of the kingdom. They don't know what they're doing, right? You go out there in the world, you get it killed. But if you're inward focused, it's us and nobody else. Look at our little clique, right? We don't help anybody. So let's just kind of change the way we think about this. We're, we're, we have an inward focus with an outward purpose. Does that make sense? Yep. That's the way the church is supposed to be. An inward focus with an outward purpose. We come here together gathering to learn a new way of life and then bringing that beauty to the, uh, to the ends of the earth to be, to be witnesses for Christ, right? So other people can see the way we live and hopefully they can be swayed to live that way as well. This community, loved ones, listen. This community should be greatly influenced because of this church. This community should notice that we're here. This community should be different because this church exists. That's the reason why it's here. So years and years ago, when I was working at Advantage Chrysler, down in Mount Dora, selling cars. I was there for years and years and years. And I sold cars, and it was going pretty well, and I made a good living and everything. And then I found Christ. Christ found me. Whatever your theology is, we could fight about that. 
But we found each other, and I fell in love. And so my life changed dramatically. Well, here's the deal. This is what happened. So I'm there at church. I'm not near at church. I'm there at the dealership. And, you know, as a salesman, I don't know how many people have sold cars here before, but in any, way, in any type of sales, what's the first thing you do? You make conversation with the person, right? Make, find some common ground. Oh, you're a police officer. Well, hey, my dad was, you know, that kind of thing. My dad was a police officer. Now I'm your buddy. I can rip you off. Right? That's the way it works, right? Oh, you're in the Navy? I was too. You want to pay more? That's the way it works, right? That's what we're taught to do. And when they drive up, you look at their car that they're driving, and you look for stickers and stuff, military or anything like that. that can, oh, you're a Yankees fan? So am I. My uncle used to be a, a player on the, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So, so you make small talk with people because you want to figure out some common ground. So it was amazing. Like down here in Florida, you guys know this, and many of you are probably like this. Like a lot of us weren't born here, right? We were born in other places, but then, then now you're here, right? You moved here. So I would meet these people time and time again once I became a Christian. Like this never seemed to happen before I was a Christian. But now all of a sudden I am a Christian, and I'm asking these people like, that are from, you know, Ohio and Indiana and California and New Hampshire and all these different places, like, and they moved here. I'm like, so why, why, why do you live here? Like, of all the places you could live, why, why do you live, why, why, why here? You know, right here in this immediate area. You know, Mount Dora, Eustis, Leesburg, Tavares, right here, right? Why, why did you choose here? And, and you'd think... Well, I mean, it's Lake County, right? So there's, I mean, awesome fishing here, right? Awesome fishing. That's one of the main attractions. Um, great golf. That's the reason why I came to Florida was because of golf. Golf was the motivator for me to come down. So you think, well, there's tons of golf courses, and, and you can retire here, and you can play lots of great golf, or there's great fishing, right? So you think, you know, maybe once in a while you get an answer like that. But it was the strangest thing. All of a sudden, everyone that I asked that, they'd give me the same stinking answer. And it was, well, we felt like this is where God wanted us. I'm like, what? 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 What is that? I found that to be a very, very odd answer. That was a very weird answer, you know? I just, we just felt that this is where God wanted us. I mean, you didn't get called here because you were retiring and you wanted to play golf or fish. No, it's where we thought God wanted us. I have a lot to say about this. But I want to ask you guys to do something this morning. I thought this would be valuable. I'm going to hope that this is the Lord's leading. I have a reason. I, I, I believe there's some reasons why God did that. I, I, have a, I have some reasons why I think God spoke to people and said, I want you to come down here. Now, there's a great population of Christian folks in this area. But much like America that says that they're a Christian nation, we can't really smell Christ. This is a microcosm of our country. There's a lot of Christians here. But do you, do you smell Christ? Is he the, you know when you walk into a room and someone, and, and, and Jen's got the crock pot in there? You walk in, you can, it permeates the whole room, right? You smell it. You're like, hmm, something special is going on here, right? If the vast majority of the people in this community are followers of Christ, and time and time again they were moved here because that's where they thought God wanted them. I want you to ponder this for a second. And Jerome's going to stand up and he's going to offer a microphone to you. And, and listen, stay on point. Don't get carried off in some tangent. Why do you think God brought a bunch of Christ followers to this community. Why are you here? Anybody? No. Jerome, turn the, is that on? Press the button. Is it on? Talk. Hello? Yes. No, it's not. No. Let me see. Now it works. Go for it. Hello. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Why do you think the Christians are here? Why are there so many people here? This is a place that needs a little bit of help, a little bit of work to help build and create more Christians in this area. Okay. 
there's people that are lacking that need need to know Christ and as Christians here brought here and put here so we can help get all the other people saved and bring them in okay here that's what I would presume okay anybody else go ahead Jerome run it back there to him please Rich back there I, I, I believe that God brought me here to save my life. He uh, delivered me from a bad situation, and I wound up in Leesburg and literally saved my life. Thank you. Anybody else down here? All oh, right, right here, right here. Closer. Why are they all here? I wanted to uh, put my belief into action. I have been a um, not a participant. I wanted to get off the bench and uh, reach out to people. In this church, I felt a, uh, a call to action. I felt an energy that I haven't felt other places, and I'm hopeful to uh, to to uh, reach out to others and help them find what I found here. Amen. Anyone else? Back in the corner. I appreciate you sharing why God brought you here to this church, which is valid and good. But what I'm looking for here is why do you think across the board God is telling people, Christians, to come to this area? Well, my thought is is um, if we all have one voice, one Savior, then we need to make some noise and start getting loud together as a bunch of Christians, that we shouldn't be silent anymore, that we should start speaking out. And if we all have one thing in common we should make a very loud voice into the community. Amen. Just a thought. Who else? Who else? Raise your hand right here. All right. I probably don't need this, but hey, uh, I actually came here to golf and fish, and I have done neither since the 1990s. I didn't know the Lord when I came here, so... I believe he placed me here to bring me home, but now that he's got me on his team, he needs me playing. He Amen. doesn't need me to sit back in the stands and watch everybody else do stuff. Mm -hmm. He needs us all to get on the field and take it and uh, just reclaim some ground. Amen. Amen. Yep. Right here. I believe he bought me to Florida to be right in this church where I can be highly motivated to do, to follow the Bible. I mean, you really motivate us in the name of Jesus. I never seen that. Glad so I'm proud to be here. Glad in you're the name here. Of Jesus Christ. Amen. Glad you're here. Anybody else? Yeah, right here. I don't know why he brought me here, because I have not enjoyed living here at all. This has not been a fun place to live. I moved here from a much more cultural place that I enjoyed, and I got here and I thought, what in the heck is going on in this place? But um, I believe he has, since to answer your question, I believe he has bigger plans for the church than what we have. And I believe I can say that I'm part of that. Don't know exactly what my part is, but I want to be whatever that is. Because those bigger plans are better than my plans. They're better than what I didn't see in culture, what I haven't seen in the church. And, and by the grace of God, I do love the church. And it's real easy to be critical of the church. But I know he isn't, and I want to be like him. So that's, that's how I see it. I feel like he's brought the church here because the church hasn't been here. So he's sending his people to help where it needs help at, to spread the message to the ends of the earth. So yeah. clearly, it needs to be spread here. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. I feel like God sent me here to learn more about the philosophy of everything, because before I came here, I was very mixed between everything, because I was starting to learn more about what really happened, like, I'm, I was wondering, like, what really happens? Why do everybody have different beliefs than me? Why is this not acceptable, but this is? And so when I came here, you get more of a you get more learning than you thought you would ever know. Like, I never even knew that, that, you know, like, being different than the norm was a sin or that this was completely acceptable while this wasn't. And it's nice to know that there's a people that have more of a spine to talk about the things that in the society is impossible to. Thank you, Aiden. Anybody else? Me, me, oh, Nancy. Why are they all here? We just felt like God wanted us here. This might be a little off track, and if it is, I apologize. I yep. truly Grace. believe in my heart, if I don't cry, that since God knew about each of us before we were even thought of or born, he knew the plans he had for us, and the, um, the working out of his will and purpose into each of our lives. And I truly believe as he has, um, through history, things have always worked out as far as his plan and his purpose for mankind. He has an anointing for each of us at certain times and places. And he brings events into place. And he has brought all of us here at this point in time to work in each of our lives for his glory. What we know what that is, we, we are here and we're together and we're in unity and it is our heart's desire that we go on and learn and do what he wants us to do and bring him glory. So we're here because this is the appointed time for each of us and um, we're open and we want to be together and do what he has for us to do. For his glory, so I share with you, as Glenda's getting the microphone, shared with you that the scriptures, which is supposed to frame what we think and what we do, it says that the king's glory is a growing population, okay? So when people say that it's not about numbers, you just need to hold your nose when they say that because a growing population is a number. And, and the scriptures say that it is God's desire that all, all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth. Okay, all is a very large number. That equals 7 billion. If there's one true God in all of heaven and earth, then he is the only one worthy to be praised and worshipped by all people, and there's 7 billion of them. So that's a very big number. It is about numbers, okay? It is about numbers. You know why? Because every single one of those numbers represents a person that Jesus died for. It is about numbers. Who else? Amy. Why did you move to this area? Well, we just felt this is where God wanted us to be. Why? Why do you think that all these Christians are here? What's the reason for it? Well, I had no desire to move to Florida ever. <laughs> Never, ever, ever. I had you know, Meredith and I both. This is not where our choice of places was, but through circumstances, this is where we ended up. And Mer uh, when I would come down and visit Meredith, and I would sit in the park over by Sullivan, I mean, um, Lake Gertrude, and I would look out there, and I felt at home, and I knew God wanted me here. But it was a few years later that I went to a God party at, um, out at, uh, where Big Lots um, is and McDonald's and everything. And I used to Eustace. sing. Sorry? In yeah, Eustace. Eustace. Um, jo um, anyway, I used to sing with United in Praise, and we were supporting this. We were singing in this God party. And I hung out there. A lot of people left and everything, but I hung out there. Like, there was some reason I needed to be there, and I listened to Moses talk, because Moses 
was the one who got this God party together. And that night, in my heart, I knew somehow I was going to be part of what he was talking about. <laughs> so I know that God led me here. And there's, you know, in the book of Esther, uh, <laughs> Lester's cousin um, tells her, he says, how do you know that God did not send you here except for a time is this? And that was to save her people. So I truly believe that God has me here for such a time as this, for whatever reason and whatever he has me to do. I'm older now. I don't get around as well. I don't do some of the things that I did. But I know he has a purpose for me one way or another here in this place to get his message out for such a time as this. Thank you. Any, anybody else? <laughs> Aiden, we'll save it for another. We'll get you next time. Right here. I love, Aiden, you know I love you, but um, if I give you that microphone, you will speak till 3 o'clock. And we know this. And we love you. We love you. But we're going to hang out in there after you can tell everybody personally. Yeah, yeah. All right. Real quick, go ahead. Yes. And I had no idea what Florida was. I had no idea how I, why I existed. But I feel like if I were to, if I were to stay in Ohio, I feel like I missed out on a really, really good life because I have a society that accepts me here. We do love you. I have the ups and downs of being a 12-year-old child still. I still have public school to deal with because if anyone knows about this, everyone. <laughs> well, that's why you're there to bring good to that suck. Amen. X Man. I came to Florida out of my own selfish, worldly desire, just to be here. I have, I, I, I don't like being here, but. It helped me come back to who I'm supposed to be. And one of those things is being a Christian. And with that in mind, that's why I am currently here in this church, in this seat. Because I want to be with a body of believers that's going somewhere. I want to be where I'm a part of the body doing something to advance the kingdom. But... Being here in Florida, in all honesty, I hate it, <laughs> you know, and I never, and I gave, oh, goodness, what I gave up to be here, but all of that, as the saying goes, that's then, this is now. and this is now, yeah. and that's where I'm at, gotcha. so. Glad you're here. That's why I'm here. Anybody else? Oh, back here, Mike. <laughs> Come on, JC, run, man, run. You know getting old. I'll, I will knock you out. I will knock him out right here in church. Say I won't. Uh, I believe God has called the Christians here. Uh, right there the answer is to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, to be a city on the hill to those who are broken, who are lost and in darkness. All right, listen. This is what I think, and I'm going to tell you why I started this church. There's 400,000 churches in this country, and we don't smell Christianity anywhere we go. And that didn't sit well with me. When I got saved, it wrecked me. It wrecked me. And so I felt the need to be, to be part of that, that, that wave of God's Spirit that wrecks people. Okay, and so I planted a church to unite the family of God, right? They're here, 
but they're all different, and they all have, what are you? I'm a Baptist. What are you? I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal. What are you? I'm a this. I'm a that. No, no. That's why I started a non-denominational church. What are you? I'm a Christ follower, okay? I'm a follower of the way, right? To, to unite the family. That's why I started a non-denominational church, a church where, where everyone who has bent the knee to Jesus could actually sit in the same room get over themselves and love the other people more than themselves. So when they're weird and they're speaking in tongues next to you, that you're like, you know what, that's totally weird, but I love them more than I love me, so I'm going to sit here and let them be weird, right? It's okay to be different, but that's not like that. And so one of the reasons why the church is so weak in America is because we're divided into all these little groups Right? Like, just like our society, we're all divided. Everyone hates each other. So, so instead of being like brothers, like literally brothers and sisters in Christ, and getting along and putting up with our own little quirks and weird stuff, right? We separate and splinter and weaken. And that's why so many churches close because we're so weakened, right? We don't have any, we don't have enough resources to even stay open. We don't need more churches. We need more effective, powerful churches. That's what we need, right? We don't need to split and you take your gifting over here, your gifting and your resources, and you start your own church and you can suffer down there and barely pay your rent. And we'll do the same thing over here. We'll get our own little group over here and we'll take just our half of what we had and start a new church and limp and limp and try to make it, right? And not pay our rent either. That's what happens. So I believe that, that, that I was supposed to plant a church that united all of those people. Because you know what? When I was at the dealership and I said, what brought you here? And they said, well, we felt like God wanted us here. I didn't say, oh, awesome. Are you Baptist? I, I didn't say that. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. Right? Is Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life? No one gets to the Father except through me. The rest of it, you can have a freaking committee about it. It doesn't make any difference, right? He's the only way. We exalt Christ. So let's all get together in a room together and do this, right? So I, I started this church to unite the family, okay? I started this church to awaken the family, right? The Bible says to fan the flame of your faith, right? By preach, boldly preaching the word of God that equips all of his people for every good work. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's all I'm ever going to do. Don't ever ask me to do anything else. That's my job to preach the word of God without apology from start to finish, cover to cover, to equip you to do the work that God's called you here to do. That's what the church is supposed to be for, right? And then to change the world. That's what this church is supposed to be. Like, you got I know it's hard because we only have like 30 people in the room or something, right? This church is not all it's, it, it's that you see. This church was intended to be planted to change the world. It's one of those churches, Right? Not another little group of people that comes in here and hangs out. That's what we're seeing right now. We've been seeing it for too long. For years and years and years, we've been seeing this little church barely making it, just getting by, a nice little group of people coming in, kumbaya, and go home. That needs to end. Right? That needs to end. If once and for all the kingdom of God and the king of this kingdom means something to you, then you buy into his program and you make it the priority of your life and there's no more going on Facebook and begging people to come to participate. That's what you've been called to do by the king. He said, go make disciples, be my witness, gather, pray, sing, give, serve, daily, boldly, every day, no option. It's not up to you. That's what the church is supposed to be because it's supposed to be powerful enough to change the entire world. How do you get the results they had on Acts? When they met every single day for 810 days straight to do this, what we're doing right now. And that's how the whole Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's why so many people got saved. That's why somehow it came to Leesburg and you got saved. How did this even happen? Except for massive effort. Net dedication like you've never seen before. They gave their lives to this. Some of them even died to do this. That's why you're saved and you get to go to glory. Because And that's the way the church is supposed to be. So I'm not here to sugarcoat it. I need to get off the fence and just tell you. Absolute commitment to the kingdom of God. That's what he's telling you to do. That's what our church needs to be to reach the ends of the earth. And nothing short right? That's the sudden and momentous shift in the status quo, right? That's a revolution. 
And that's not what our country has. Churches aren't saying this. Their the pastor's not getting up and saying, listen, you need to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. Give everything you have, all that you are, to the kingdom of God, advancing his purposes. That's what it says, right? I didn't make it up. If I was going to make up my holy book, it would not say that. Because most people don't want to give that. So I'm going to, give, I'm going to come up with something that's a little more reasonable, right? Because then maybe you'd give a little bit more and help a little bit more. Lower the bar, right? God's bar is through the roof. And it's not optional. So here's how a real revolution happens. Filled with the Holy Spirit, all the believers will meet and gather constantly to pray endlessly, to sing passionately, to study carefully, to give generously, to encourage one another lovingly, and to boldly share Jesus relentlessly with every single person that they meet. That's a revolution. Okay, that's a revolution. And that's what this church was planted for. And listen, loved ones, nothing less than that. That's probably why you see me like freaking out up here every single week. Because that's what the church was supposed to be. And that's not what it is. Okay? It's not what it is. I shouldn't want to quit and go elsewhere. I should want to be here. Because this is what the church was supposed to be. This church was supposed to be the city on a hill. Where this whole community could see hope. Right? He supernaturally provided for this group of people that's smaller than what's in this room right now. He supernaturally provided. We had no money. No people, and look, look what you're sitting in. 10,000 square feet of prime commercial real estate provided for this little group of people that had no money in the most high traffic area where the most people are, where there was no church. Why do you think he did this? So you could come once in a while? No. Why? Why, why? why do you think he did this? Feel this comfortable seat on your rear end you're sitting on. You didn't buy it. He did. Someone else did. So that you could be here to bring glory to the name of Christ. That's why this church was planted here. And for nothing less. And now he's placed you and I here to be that church that he planted years ago. A highly visible, very vocal, loving community of faith. Bringing beauty to the world. And there's a massive fight to do this. And that's why we see empty room most of the time. There's a massive fight. You're self-centered. And you're lazy. And so am I. So our self doesn't want to commit to doing this. Our society doesn't want to help you do this. Our government's trying to tell you not to do this. Your family and friends that say they love you are telling you you're a radical freak. Don't do that. Do this. There's all kinds of forces working against this, and we're losing. But Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Now go. He should win. He should win. Right? The world doesn't want this. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. John 15, 18, the world hates you, and it hates me, Jesus said. He said in John 17, 16, you are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God, and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. The tr these truths that I just share with you make our task tough. It's hard. But all authority on heaven and earth is his. And so nothing else has the right to tell you not to do this. And you don't need to listen to it anymore. Including yourself that says, no, don't do it. Don't do it. And here's the thing. As we use the weapons of our warfare, which are love and compassion and prayer and service, right? evangelizing the community, as we use these things to advance Christ's kingdom and the good that it brings, the world will fight against us aggressively. They will come after you, right? They will, they will, they will get violent. They will, they will shred you publicly, verbally, 
physically, everything. That's where they, they, listen, Jesus said they hate you. Hate's a strong word, man. Hate motivates. Hate makes people do crazy things. Look in our text. Look at verse 32. Look what it says. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. Screaming, shouting, and they didn't even know why they were there. They were trying to promote the gospel, advance the kingdom, and the people went crazy, and they didn't even know why. Total confusion. I mean, I'll tell you what, again, I don't want to get too political, but when you read that, right, that sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? It sounds awfully familiar. Craziness, confusion, riots, uneducated sheeple, unsaved people swept into a wave of cultural chaos. Right? Why? Because they took their eyes off of Christ. Now, I'm not going to say that all the people that are in these riots and all over our country are Christians, but I'm going to speak to, to, to this. No Christian should ever be involved in those things. Ever. The way we advance our purposes is with love and prayer and serving, praying for our enemies. We don't burn their buildings down, right? We pray for them. You know, these protests in America, I don't know when, when George Floyd, what the date was when, when he was killed. And I'm, I'm as stupid about this stuff as the rest of us. We are, we're fed, whether you're on CNN or Fox, you know, who knows, right? I'm not, I wasn't there. Anybody there when George Floyd got killed? I wasn't there. So, you know, depending on what channel or what YouTube vlog you're watching, they'll give you their opinion. The guy died on this day. The cop was holding him down. He dies. The, 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 the city did an autopsy on him. They said that the, the knee on the neck had nothing to do with his death. Well, they're all corrupt. So we're going to get the... So the family did an independent. Guess what? Same result. The knee on the neck had nothing to do with him, his death. But yet, freely on TV, freely, the murder, the murder of, the murder of, the, the mur- he didn't get murdered. I mean, the, his own family did an autopsy and said that, that it didn't murder him. But yet, over and over. So people are uneducated, and they just get swept into this chaos across the country. And it started with his death. And now... Crazy mobs are burning down Wendy's, smashing in windows of Starbucks, lighting federal buildings on fire, destroying police stations, whipping bricks and lumber and Molotov cocktails and spitting on cops that are both black and white. It's chaos, right? Just like we saw in the Bible. People are so uneducated, they just get swept into this cultural chaos and they go crazy. And guess what? They don't even know why they're there. When was the last time we heard George Floyd's name? It's been weeks. But yet they're burning cities down. Supposedly about him, and they don't even talk about it anymore. Why are you there? I don't know. I'm just burning this building down because everyone else is doing it. Looks like a great time to get a brand new TV. Oh, thanks, George. I'm not disrespecting him. I'm sad that this happened to the man. From what I understand, there was a time in his life he was passionate about the kingdom of God. Passionate about the kingdom of God. He used to go through the neighborhood and tell the little kids that were troublehead, knuckleheads about Jesus. That's awesome. And drugs got a hold of him. That's sad. It's awful. I feel bad about that. But most of this chaos in the country is just like it was here in the book of Acts. They don't even understand what they're doing, and they just get wrapped up in chaos. Listen, that's a whole different kind of revolution. That's not the type of revolution that Christians are involved with. Christians' revolution looks like love. It's a massive difference between this kind of revolution and the one we're called to be a part of. Remember this? When Jesus was in the garden, he got arrested. What did Peter do? Right to the sword. He chops off the guy's ear. What does Jesus say? No. That is not the way Christians accomplish anything. Jesus puts the guy's ear back on. That's way cool. But what, what, did he say, what did he say to the sword? No. This is not the way we act. That's not the way we act at all. Sort of 
we've been tasked as a family of faith to change our community on a large scale. We're called to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city on a hill. So as we finish up here, land this plane now. I just want to say we've been called to push back darkness in all of its manifestations. That's who we are. That's who this church is supposed to be. No longer limp. No longer weak. No longer anemic. No longer sitting on the fence. I'm challenging every single one of you right now. Be here every single week. Be here every single week. Be a part of the solution. Be a part of the church that Jesus Christ has set up worldwide to change the world and right here supernaturally created this thing for you to be a part of so you could be the church that changes this community. That's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to change, push back darkness in, in business, in our schools, in every single place that we are. Us being here should shift our community. It should change this whole community. It should be noticeable because Revolution Church is here. But this only happens when all of us make the choice to finally make Jesus Christ our only master. And we've been running around, all of us, even the most devoted here, running around devoted to many masters. And that's what keeps us from, from, from making this the singular purpose of our life, which is what the Bible teaches. This is why you live. This is who we are. And I just want to, like, there's all kinds of ways I could be a creative orator and say, listen, we should do it this way, this way. Let's just say this. I love you, you're my friends, okay? Let's be that church. Can we just be that church? Like, does anyone want to go to their grave with, with, with regret and say, you know what, if I had just done this, who knows what would have happened, right? That would have been awesome. I don't want you to go to your grave like that. I don't want to go to my grave like that. I want this church, I have this thing in my head, this vision of what God ha has, has spoken to me about what this church is supposed to be. And I'm telling you right now, honest, it's never even been close. We've never got there. And I'm just asking you once and for all, would you just be part of getting it there? That's how he does it. He takes the ones that are here and builds on them to reach others for his name's sake and his glory. When all of us make Jesus our master, that means that we tenaciously pursue a relationship with him through dedicated prayer and attending and serving and giving and worship, and Bible study, both personally and corporately, right? And these are daily endeavors. This is, I'm not making any of this up. This is what it says. You guys know that, right? That's what it says. So just look at that and, and look at your life. Is that what you're doing? Is that what you're doing? No. Isn't that why 6,000 churches close every year? Yes. Is that what we should let happen here? No, and it's not the people that aren't here. It's not their fault. It's ours, me, you, us, the ones that are on those cards that you have that you're calling, oh, I love this place. It's awesome, and then they never come. They don't participate. 240 million Christians, and only 30 million go to church. 210 million Christians in this country are not participating in the church that Jesus Christ has ordained to advance his purposes. They're sitting at home doing other stuff. Can we please not be that church? Please. I don't have way to say it, right? Please stop. Can we be different finally? Can we see this community change because there was a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo? That this community changed drastically because we were here? Can't, can't we be that people? Aren't we, don't we have the anointing on us, Nancy? Aren't we here with the Holy Spirit in us? Don't we have the mind of Christ? Don't we have the spirit of Christ? Don't we have the word of the Lord? Don't we have a place to gather? Don't we have a purpose to accomplish? Don't we have a power in us? 
We do. It's time to use it. And all of us engaging in the, with the lost world in all environments, all settings, all contexts, everybody sharing the gospel of Christ at all times with all people. And that's the only way we're going to reach the ends of the earth and make disciples of all people. But listen, it's your choice. God's never going to force you to do it. You have to make a choice. And I'm challenging you right now to make that choice once and for all to be the church God envisioned right here at Revolution not some little church that gathers a couple of us having a nice time it's awesome that we're together but you know that's not the ultimate purpose right you know that there's something missing in this room right now you can sense it and so can I that there's something wrong and there's something lacking and there's something needed and there's something that God wants to happen right here and you know it. I'm not the only one. I could put my Bible down and say, come up and preach, and you'll tell everybody the way you feel too. You know there's something you were supposed to be doing. You know that something's supposed to be here, and it hasn't happened in 10 years. And I'm just saying, let's stop that. Let's make a difference. Let's change the world that we're in. God changed the world with 12 dudes. There's double that in this room. Pray with me. Father, my prayer is simple because I'm a simple man. My prayer is that you will forgive us for our lethargy, our complacency. For every person that's in this room, I speak for them. I speak for those that are sitting at home watching this or who might watch it in the next day or two. I repent, Lord. I repent of my lethargy. I, I repent of knowing what to do and not doing it. Your word is very, very clear. When we know to do good and we don't, it is sin. And we repent of that. It is clear what you've called us to. Your scripture is very clear. It's on a bottom shelf that all of us can attain. We can all get to it. We can all read it. And we all know it. We know what you want. We have not lived it. And there's a fight for this, Lord. Even now as, as the pastor is speaking and encouraging you to do what the scriptures say. There's things that are coming up that are fighting you and saying you shouldn't do that. You do enough. Enough is enough. He's asking too much. I have this plan and I have that to do and all these things. And I would just say that the word of God is speaking loudly against those things that are trying to get you to not. So God, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying Fill us with your spirit that we might follow you once and for all. Take this thing seriously. It's not a joke. We're not going to treat it as common. Dedicated. Committed to advancing your kingdom to the ends of the earth. That's what we're for. Lord, you have, you, I, pray, I pray that you'd give all of them, all the people in this room right now, a, a vision in their own mind. A vision of, in their own mind of what this church should look like, what it should be, how it should function, what it should look like, who should be here, all of that. Pour into them, Lord. Pour into them a vision. Not my vision, your vision for them, your vision for us. Motivate them, inspire them, fan the flames of their faith, Lord. Give them something to have to grab hold of. And now, Lord, we're going to give. We're going to give. We're going to be people who are giving. We're going to be generous. We're going to be generous because that's what you've called us to be. You told us to be generous. Giving is better than receiving. If you plant sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you plant bountifully, you, re you reap bountifully. That's what you said. That's what we want to do because your kingdom means something. No longer should our church be struggling and suffering and scraping to get by as we all live with our own needs and take care of our own stuff. We neglect your house. We neglect your mission. No more. Inspire us now, Lord, to be generous people. Help us not to be a suffering church anymore in that way, but to, be, to flourish. Not so anyone can get a raise, but that we can be a city on a hill that actually helps this community. A place of resource and help and love and hope. That's what we need to be, a storehouse, God. So speak to your people now and inspire them to be generous, Lord, once and for all. 
Ask the Lord, folks. Ask him what you should do. Ask him what giving looks like. Ask him what it means for you to be generous. Let go. Let go. And, and be a part of his kingdom. Advance his purposes. And so pray for that for a few moments. I'll shut up and you guys pray. And then some guys will come through the room with some baskets and just give generously. And if you don't want to do the basket thing, it's fine. There's boxes on the back wall. You can give that way. There's a computer in the front lobby, and it, you can give that way too through Square. Whatever you want to do on our website, anything. It doesn't matter. But just pray and ask the Lord what he, should, he would want you to do, and then give that way. These guys are going to come through the room. Just, I just encourage you to just do whatever the Lord leads you to do. Trust Him. Trusting Him is hard though, right? It is hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. So often, you know, you come to church and you hear a message and it's like, man, that's good. It's inspiring. He's talking just to me. The Lord's talking just to me. And then you forget it by like Monday. And I know that. I don't want to say that this message is more important than any I've ever preached, but I don't know. I just like you're here today. And, and you know what God wants, and you, you know what God wants of you, and you know what God wants for this church, and it's never amounted to that. And I'm just, I just want to challenge you to just hunker down. Like, if, 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 if Christ and lost people mean anything, then let's not be that church that's struggling to just barely survive. Let's be a thriving church that changes the community. And it takes all of our participation. You can't just pick and choose when it's convenient for you. Right? It's just brutal honesty in church. It just is, and you know it. So I just want to encourage you to be active participants in what Christ is trying to accomplish in this community through this church.